Y'all yeah, don't quit on my account. I'm running behind. We'll uh, we'll we'll get started though. If y'all are if y'all are ready, I I can be ready. We're going to round out Nahum tonight, Lord willing. And if we don't, that's fine. Maybe the Lord will give us another week, and we can do it then. Uh, but we're going to be looking at the last part of Nahum. And uh, so far, we've kind of broken it down piece by piece into some verses that don't necessarily correspond with the chapters as far as an outline is concerned. And sometimes that can make things difficult. But uh, tonight, we have a really big chunk of text to get through, and that comes with its own challenges. So we're not going to read the text like we have before. You know, we start with just reading the text and then maybe talk about a couple of things before we move into the, the broader picture. But we will be reading some. So if you want to turn to Nahum chapter 3, um, obviously we'll be in chapter 2 verse 9 and following to the end of the book. But for the most part we'll be in chapter 3 as we look at the last part of uh, this, this uh, really wonderful book. I've enjoyed this study. I hope you have. The offer still stands if any of the gentlemen in here would like to teach for a quarter. It doesn't even have to be a quarter. If you want to teach uh, just one class, maybe get some time teaching and, and uh, doing that, that's fine. I don't have to be gone for somebody else to teach. So uh, if you would like to do that, just let me know. But if no one says anything, we'll move right along and uh, maybe next week we'll start something new. And by the way, I haven't decided what we're going to start yet. Normally I've done that by now but uh, I haven't decided yet, and so if anyone has any suggestions, I'm all ears, more than happy to, to take suggestions. All right, let's look at our outline for the book, kind of remind us where we've been. By the way, if you can see the picture in the background, that is the gate of Nineveh, so you can imagine being someone like Jonah walking up to that gate, or someone like Nahum living inside those gates. The book of Nahum starts with that beautiful poem, that partial acrostic in chapter 1, verse 2 through 8, talking about the severity and graciousness of God. So you'll recall we were talking about uh, God's wrath and God's love coexisting within the holiness of God. How is it that God can be a God of wrath and a God of love all at the same time? Well, it is because He is a holy God. Holiness is the fundamental essence of God, and without holiness, God would not be God. And then, last week, we looked at chapter 1, verse 9, to chapter 2 and verse 2, which shows us the reality of God's character, judgment, and ultimately the deliverance of Judah. It's, it's interesting, if you ever get the chance or, or have a way of doing this, to read Nahum without chapter and verse divisions. Because what you see in the second section, chapter 1, verse 9, to chapter 2 and verse 2, is almost opposite of what you see throughout the remainder of the, of the book. So chapter 1, verse 9 to chapter 2 and verse 2 is relatively positive. And, and I mean that in the sense of being positive for the children of Israel and for the people of Judah, not positive, obviously, for the inhabitants of Nineveh and Assyria. But the final section is chapter 1... Uh, or excuse me, chapter 2 and verse 3 through uh, chapter 3 and verse 19, which is the end of the book. And this is, as I've uh, called it on the slide, a graphic poetic account of the siege and fall of Nineveh. Now, part of reading the Bible is having to accept what the Bible says, how the Bible says it. And that doesn't sound like earth-shattering information, but to some of us it may well be. Because we have uh, made our Bibles politically correct. We have heard texts preached over and over again that have softened the reality of what the text is actually saying. And so if you're taking notes and you're writing down this outline, you, you may find it beneficial to underline the word graphic. The last part of Nahum is not for the faint of heart, especially if you read it from a cultural perspective, which we're going to do tonight. Uh, I love studying the Bible, and I love studying the Bible from a historical cultural perspective, because I am of the persuasion, and maybe I can be persuaded differently, but I am of the persuasion that you cannot understand what the text 
of Scripture says that was written thousands of years ago in a different context, in a different language, in a different world without first understanding that world. And so it's the job of preachers and teachers and, and others and those of us who study the Bible on our own, which I know all of us do, to dive into that for whatever it is. And so that's what we're going to do tonight for uh, the majority of this because, as I know you all have done, you've read Nahum all the way through. It's only three chapters. It's not a long read. But ha did, you, did you read parts of it and kind of wonder what in the world is this saying? That's usually how prophecy goes. Prophecy is difficult to interpret, especially prophecy that is written using the imagery popular of that day. So uh, it, it's going to be a challenge for us, but it's not a challenge that we can't do together. So before we get into the final part of Nahum, I want to just pause for a minute and ask if anyone has any questions or comments about the first two parts of Nahum before we dive into part number three. All right. Well, let's get into it then. In Nahum chapter 3 and verse 1, I'm reading from the New English Translation. It says, Woe is the city guilty of bloodshed. She is full of lies. She is filled with plunder. She has hoarded her spoil. Above the text in my Bible, it says, The sins of Nineveh. So, why is God so against Nineveh? Because remember where we left Nineveh 150 years prior. We left a repentant city. We left a city that was dedicated to, uh, to, to righteousness at least. They had repented of their sin at the preaching of Jonah. And even though Jonah was upset about that, the people were doing the right thing. And 150 years pass and it seems like that has completely gone out the window. So what are the sins of Assyria? Well, there are three that are listed here. The first is that the city is guilty of bloodshed. Now, you've all probably seen, and maybe you have a footnote in your Bible, or if you have a study Bible, you'll surely have this. Uh, the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians were incredibly violent, the Assyrians especially. And uh, the Assyrians were so violent that they boasted in their violence, and, and it was... Uh, it was something to be proud of. So for example, uh, here, here's an inscription from Ashurbanipal, who was the king of Assyria. And uh, he said this about his conquest. He said, I captured many soldiers alive. The rest of them I burnt. I built a pile of men and heads before his gate. I erected 700 soldiers on stakes before their gate. That's pretty violent, isn't it? Uh, you see the... Uh, I don't know what you would call this, this uh, carving in the picture. And I don't know if you all can see, because obviously it's a, it's a picture of a carving, but with the projection and everything, I don't know how good it's going to be. Uh, I'm not an artist. I don't play one on TV, and I don't have a degree in art history. But I do want to show you some things about this that will be uh, in, important for our study here of the fall of Assyria. So what you have are two Assyrian soldiers here. And they are behind a group of Nubian soldiers who have been captured in war. So a couple of things about this, and, and by the way, this will be important in a couple of slides. The Nubians that you see here are virtually naked. And that was a common practice in the ancient Near East to show shame. You parade people naked through the streets and... Uh, some have even suggested, and I think they're right, that when the Israelites were led into captivity, they were probably bound in shackles and taken naked, as it was a sign of shame in that day. So you have the Nubians here. They are shackled, and they're uh, walking in, in their uh, captivity. You have the Assyrians, who are uh, completely clothed in armor, like they're victorious in battle. And by the way, the Nubians are clean-shaven. The Assyrians have their beards. Beards are a sign of prominence. But in the Assyrians' hands, there are decapitated heads of Nubian soldiers. Now, I want you to imagine that you live in this time and you've been captured in battle 
and the people who captured you are carrying the head of your buddy. That's violent, isn't it? That's bloodshed. Now, why do I show a picture like this and give you an inscription from Ashurbanipal? First of all, I think it highlights the importance of the text. But secondly, think about our world. Think about the senseless violence that is in our world. Now, I'm not talking about war. And I'm not talking about protecting your life or anything like that. But if you ask a Christian, what's the worst sin in the world today? Well, if you ask a studied Christian, they may tell you that there's no such thing as a worse sin or better sin because you know, we've, we've VBSed Revelation 21.8 and that's been a horrible thing because Revelation 21.8 is a dangerous verse and it gives a sin list of all of those who will be in hell. So yes, lying can get you into hell just as quickly as murder can. If you ask someone who has a general working knowledge of the Bible and claims to be a faithful person, what's the worst sin in America today? Uh, I'm not a betting man, but I would wager that they would say something along the lines of a sexual sin. Homosexuality, transgenderism, LGBTQ+, uh, people having sexual relationships before they're married, or the divorce rate uh, because of adulterous relationships, so something along those lines. And you know what? That's a very big problem in our world today. Huge problem. I've noticed that Kayla and I don't have... Uh, uh, TV in the regular sense, but we have streaming services and sometimes you watch commercials on the streaming services. And I've noticed over the past couple of years the prevalence of homosexual couples in, in our commercials and, and all of that. But you know, the, the LGBTQ plus community makes up less than 1% of America's population. So what's the biggest sin? Well, that may be the most prevalent. If you ask that question to a Jew living in the Old Testament, violence would be the number one answer. In fact, every book of prophecy in our Old Testament has violence as the main cause of action for God. And it was in one of two ways. On the one hand, you have the people of Israel before the captivity. And their big sin... It was twofold. Number one, violence. And number two, social injustice. They weren't taking care of the stranger or sojourner in their land. The rich were getting rich off of the poor, and the poor were getting poorer. Sound familiar? And so I wonder sometimes, and I'm not saying that there's anything inherently wrong with it, it's just me thinking out loud. I wonder what God thinks whenever we turn on a movie about that where the main plot is unnecessary or senseless violence. You know, we, we would be really quick to turn a overly sexual movie off in the presence of our children. Would we do the same with an overly violent movie? What was the sin that caused a world power, the world power, to fall? Violence. Something to think about. I'm not saying that that's necessarily the answer, but something to think about. The second thing is lies. Verse 3, the second line says, she is full of lies. Now obviously, telling the truth is better than lying. Right? The Lord would have us be truthful people. Do not bear false witness. Let your yes be yes and your no be, be no. Be people of integrity and tell the truth. Uh, whether you love him or you hate him, it doesn't really matter. Jordan Peterson has a, uh, a quote or maybe it's one of his rules in 12 Rules for Life. that says, don't, don't, li don't lie or at least always tell the truth. Well, what was the lie that Nineveh was guilty of or that Assyria was guilty of? Well, maybe it's a couple of things. Maybe it's political. You know, maybe it's, it's people in power making promises and not keeping them. Maybe 
there's a correlation between a lie and pride. Because when we're filled with pride, and Assyria certainly was as the world power, and every world power since has been filled with this sense of pride, like you cannot fall and you cannot be taken over, even though history would say that's certainly not the case. You lie to yourself saying that. Saying, no one can touch me. I will always and forevermore be powerful. So maybe that has something to do with it. Maybe it's just... Uh, a, a poetic term that's used to show the uh, immorality of the city. The, the last two go together, the last two lines. She is filled with plunder and she has hoarded her spoil. Uh, well, what, what does that mean? Uh, we've talked before about how Assyria invaded the nation of Judah. First they invaded Israel And uh, the the practice of Assyria, this is why it's so weird to read about Assyria in the the Old Testament. Because the practice of Assyria was to take over a nation. And in doing that, you don't want to kill everybody. You want to threaten to kill everybody, but you don't really want to do that because you want people to pay you tribute on a continual basis. If you kill everybody, you might be able to plunder the city, but that's the extent of the riches. You don't have a way for that line to continually come. But what's weird is that Assyria ransacked the northern tribe of Israel, the northern nation of Israel, and then took tribute from southern Judah, and then came back and ransacked Judah, even though they had a a steady stream of, uh, of tribute coming in. She has, she is filled with plunder, she has hoarded her spoil. A couple of things here. Uh, not only is it important how you get your riches, it's equally important what you do with them once you have them. So I don't know if you've ever done uh, a study on Nineveh as a city or Assyria as a nation. Nineveh was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Of course, that would be after the fall of Assyria. Uh, with people like Nebuchadnezzar and and others. But Nineveh was a beautiful city. And it was that way, first of all, because the engineering that went into the city was earth-shattering. And Nineveh lay right along um, these rivers, and that was able to water, provide water to, to the city. Absolutely beautiful city but just like any other beautiful place there are people who have absolutely nothing and the people who have absolutely nothing in the ancient world worked and labored for the people who had everything now this is not an argument for anything communist or socialist But it is an argument to say that the Lord has charged His people with taking care of those who are less fortunate than we are. And uh, I was was actually listening to a podcast this morning uh, from the Freed Hardeman Lectures, the Open Forum, and one of the questions was, you see somebody standing on the side of the road asking for money or food, what do you do? And one of the speakers says, whenever I have an answer that can be applicable to everybody, I'll let you know. And the answer basically was, it's your personal decision. You can't help everybody. That's true. You have to be a steward of your means. That's also true. But to sit on your spoil and to sit on your riches is very selfish. And uh, I am overwhelmingly humbled and blessed to say that I get to work with a congregation where the people in it aren't like that. It's a huge blessing. Not every congregation has that. So here are the three sins that are listed of Nineveh. And uh, we've already touched on this a little bit, but my question is, you know, the more I read the Bible, the more I try to look at what's not there. We can easily see what is there, and that's worthy of our study, but what's not there that we might expect to be there? So these are the sins that are listed. They're certainly not the only sins. And I think, what are the sins that aren't listed? Well, what about... Sexual sin. There's no sexual sin listed there. Is sexual sin a problem? Absolutely. 
But I think sometimes we run into the problem, like we mentioned earlier, of putting one sin above another. And maybe we do that because, uh, for better or worse, we have cultural uh, results and cultural consequences that come with certain sins. You know, heaven forbid, and I never would, but if I was to cheat on Kayla and have an affair, I might lose my job, I might have to go to counseling, but I probably wouldn't go to jail for it. That's true. Have you met my wife? Yeah, it's a good deterrent. Um, You probably wouldn't go to jail, but you can kill somebody and go to jail, right? And that has caused a modern way of thinking to put certain sins above one another. But as we mentioned earlier, Revelation 21, 8, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, you know, all of these sins break us from the community and relationship of God. Okay? And I think Nahum highlights that here with Assyria. Okay, any questions or comments before we move on? All right. There are several depictions of Assyria in chapter 3 and in the latter part of chapter 2. So I want to explain some of these, and as we're reading, maybe it will help us uh, picture the, the imagery that's being used here. So this is in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, Where now is the den of lions and the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion, lioness, and lion cub once proud and no one disturbed them? The lion tore apart as much prey as his cubs needed and strangled prey for his lionesses. He, uh, he filled his lairs with prey and his dens with torn flesh. So what's all this about the lion? Uh, in the ancient world, a lion was obviously a symbol of power and majesty most of the time. Ancient kings, whether it be in uh, Mesopotamia or Egypt or Greece or, or wherever, used the lion as a symbol of power. And, uh, but lions were also a symbol of threats because... They're, they're harmful to your agriculture. If you have livestock, a lion is a real threat. They'll come in and kill your livestock. And so we have examples in the Old Testament of certain people like uh, David, for example, killing a lion, right? And we say, well, he was a shepherd boy and he was a strong shepherd boy. You know, by the time he goes to fight Goliath, he's 17 years old. So we don't know when he killed the lion, but it was before the age of 17, which was before the legal age to fight in the army. And so uh, here's this boy going out and killing a lion. That's very impressive. That shows his might. But the author of 1 Samuel wants us to see something else. He wants us to see David as the anointed one who deals with the threats that are given toward the people of God, who are often referred to as sheep in the flock of God, you see. So, the lion is a symbol of power, but it's also a symbol of, uh, of a threat. In the picture here, this is uh, our good friend King Ashurbanipal again, driving the spear through the lion, and uh, one of the nicknames for Ashurbanipal was the Lion of Assyria. So all of that imagery is accumulating here into these two verses. And so Nahum asks, where now is the den of lions? Assyria is this mighty power, and all who look on it fear. Uh, when Kayla and I were at Disney, we took the safari ride in Animal Kingdom, and uh, we got really close to some animals. I mean, could reach out and pet them, some, uh, some giraffes and elephants and hippopotamus. And uh, those are some scary animals. But the, the lions were being lazy that day. But, you know, you could sit in that vehicle and look at those lions. And I don't know if anybody else on this ride was thinking the way I was, but I was like, I sure hope that thing doesn't wake up and decide he's hungry. All right? Well, that's how all the other nations of the world looked at Assyria. So Syria was constantly on the move, constantly on the march, constantly taking o- over other places. And they're thinking, man, I sure hope Assyria doesn't wake up and find out I'm here. Okay, so uh, maybe some imagery to help us out with that. So that, there's the first depiction of, uh, of Assyria. Now in verse 12, I need to say this before we move on. In verse 12, he says, the lion tore apart as much prey as his cubs needed. So what image does that portray of Assyria? Assyria didn't care who you were or where you were, 
If you had something they want, they were going to take it over. Absolutely ruthless. So the second and third depiction of Assyria, I had to do my PowerPoint a little weird. I apologize for that because I've got a lot of pictures in this PowerPoint. Um, the second one, remember I said the, the, you have to read the Bible for what the Bible says. That's all I'm going to do, is uh, of a harlot. In chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, Nahum writes, Because you have acted like a wanton prostitute, a seductive mistress who practices sorcery, who enslaves nations by her harlotry and entices peoples by her sorcery, I am against you, declares the Lord of heaven's armies. I will strip off your clothes, I will show your nakedness to the nations and your shame to the kingdoms. I will pelt you with filth, I will treat you with contempt, I will make you a public spectacle. Everyone who sees you will turn away from you in disgust. They will say Nineveh has been devastated. Who will lament for her? There will be no one to comfort you. I don't know about y'all, but somebody needs some ice for that burn. I mean, this is some pretty rough language. So uh, let's talk about, first of all, let's talk about the prostitute. The prostitute was a accepted but degraded part of society in the ancient world. Even in ancient Israel. Now there are some laws against prostitution in the law of Moses. So for example, the daughter of a priest cannot be a prostitute or else she's burned alive. That's a punishment. Um, and there are some others uh, along with that. But they were accepted. So for example, um, you may recall the story of Judah and Tamar. Tamar was not a prostitute, but she dressed like one and acted like one in order to receive the gift from Judah that Judah owed her and uh, she had to cheat her way through it, right, in more ways than one. And, uh, and so she used the guise of a prostitute as that. You know, Rahab was a prostitute. Uh, there are a lot of prostitutes in the Old Testament that we read about. So it's an accepted practice. Um, but what, what is it about this prostitute that's so bad? It's, it's not that she is a prostitute. It's how her shame is going to be shown and made public. So verse 5, Nahum begins by saying, I am against you, declares the Lord. He says, I will strip off your clothes, I will show your nakedness to the nations and your shame to the kingdoms. Now, when you wanted to show shame in the ancient world, just like what we saw with the Nubian prisoners on the, the other carving, you strip them naked, and you parade them through the streets. And the people on the streets come out and they throw, as our, or my New English translation says, filth on them. What is that filth? It's a good question. The word can refer to garbage, but it can also refer to the contents of a chamber pot. Now you talk about a shameful existence. That is... Now, this is harsh, and it may be shocking for us to read that, but this isn't the first time we've seen this image, and in fact, it is portrayed much more vividly in the book of Jeremiah, all throughout the book. Um, Jeremiah chapter 3 is where God says He is going to divorce Israel for her har or divorce Judah rather, for her harlotry. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I think it's Jeremiah chapter 28. I may be wrong about that. Um, where God depicts Judah as the harlot. And he says, I'm going to strip you naked. I'm going to parade you through the streets. And you're going to have filth thrown at you. And all of this shame is going to be brought on you. But it's not Assyria who is the recipient of that. It's Judah. Now what happened? Jeremiah's prophecies came true. They're led into exile. And now you have Nahum, years later, who is saying, you remember that same thing that happened to us? It's going to happen to you. Now, if you're part of the world power, and somebody says what happened to us is going to happen to you, how do you take that? Well, obviously Assyria didn't take it well or they didn't listen to it. Uh, the, 
the, the third description is of Thebes. Uh, in, in chapter 3, verse 8 through 11, your Bible may call it No Ammon. Uh, this is the ancient city of Thebes in Egypt. And uh, I won't take the time to read through all of this. Basically it says, in the same way that Thebes was overthrown, you are going to be overthrown. And uh, what's interesting about that is, does anyone happen to know who overthrew Thebes? Who's our friend we've been talking about this whole time? Ashurbanipal. Ashurbanipal, king of Assyria, overthrew Thebes in the year 663 B.C. How did he do it? Well, he went in and ransacked the city, obviously. But before that, Thebes lies right along the Nile. i got some pictures here. Uh, Thebes lies right along the Nile here. Uh, Thebes is in Upper Egypt. It's, it's always confusing because the Nile runs south to north, and this is Lower Egypt, and this is Upper Egypt. But Thebes is pretty well protected because to the, uh, to the east, you have the Red Sea. So you, if you want to invade from over here, you have to cross the Red Sea. That's hard. Down south of Thebes, there are the cataracts of the Nile. That's hard to get around. North, you have the Mediterranean Sea. And aside from the Philistines, uh, there, there are no seafaring people in the ancient world. And to the, to the uh, west, there's all desert. Okay, So very difficult to invade, but Ashurbanipal does. And he does by using Thebes' natural resource against it. He floods the city, dams it up and floods the city. Well, how does Assyria fall? Or more specifically, how does Nineveh fall? They dam up the rivers and wait for all that water to back up, break the dam. The water plows right through the wall, floods the city. There's nothing anyone can do. It's a done deal. And so in the same way that Ashurbanipal, king of Assyria, conquered Thebes, that was going to happen to him. By the way, interesting uh, historical note here. We've talked already about the plunder and the spoil that kings like Ashurbanipal would take. And uh, when, when Ashurbanipal conquered Thebes, he took back two obelisks. Does everyone know what an obelisk is? Uh, kind of like the, it's the Washington Monument is in the shape of an obelisk. Okay? He took two obelisks back to Assyria. Now think about the distance and all of the uh, natural things you have to go over with uh, the, the landscape and all and soldiers and everything. The two obelisks together weighed over 93 tons. But that's how much he wanted the plunder and spoil and the status symbol. And he's not the only one. I mean, every king had something along those lines. Uh, the last two depictions of Assyria in uh, chapter 3 are of fig trees and locusts. And I'm sorry, I should have asked before if anyone was terribly afraid of insects because this picture might be disturbing to somebody. And I, I say that half-jokingly, but I realize that may be a problem. Um, in chapter, 12, or chapter 3, verse 12 through 15, the first part of 15, we get the depiction of the fig tree. Basically, Nahum says, you're like a fig tree, you're supposed to be strong, but if I go and shake you a little bit, your fruit falls right into my mouth. So you have this picture of being strong, but we all know you're weak, and all I have to do is thump you a little bit, and I'll get what I want. And that's exactly what happens, by the way, with Nineveh and Assyria. And lastly, you have the locust. Um, in chapter 3, verse 15, the second part through verse 17, Nahum writes, Multiply yourself like the young locust, multiply yourself like the flying locust. And uh, that's the verse 15b there. Why does he say that? Well, think about locust swarms, which were all too common in the ancient world and still are in places in the Middle East. Um, how many locusts do you think are in that picture? I, yeah, all of them. I don't know. All I know is I don't want to be that guy. They're innumerable. And Nahum says, that's how your army needs to be. You need to have an innumerable, innumerable army if you have a prayer of defeating what's coming. Which is really interesting because in chapter 2 and verse 1, Nahum gives the decree, prepare yourself for battle, muster your mighty strength. 
Well, if you know you're going to fail, why put up a fight? It feeds into the arrogance of the nation. So we sang a song, uh, I think it was this past Sunday night, Barry led it, called Humble Yourself. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> that goes for more than individuals. That goes for our families, for our nations, for our governments. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Okay, any questions about any of the depictions of Assyria in chapter 3? I know that's a lot of history and a lot of imagery. All right, well now we can get to the fun part where you all talk. we got about roughly five minutes left. I only have uh, two questions tonight for this, particular, uh, for this particular section, and we can talk about it all you want. So the first has to do with unrepentant sin. We leave Nineveh in the book of Jonah, and things for the Ninevites seem to be going great. They have repented all the way from the top dog down to the lowest animal. Everyone was in an act of repenting. They realized what they had done was wrong, and they were now on the Lord's side. Now, I don't believe for a second that they gave up their other gods, but at least now they were giving Yahweh His due and were acting accordingly. 150 years pass, and we're reading a prophecy about the destruction of Nineveh. So what changed? This wasn't intended to be a difficult question. Right. Why is sin such a challenge for us? exactly right because it's fun because it serves me because as Paul says in Romans chapter 7 and 8 it is the flesh it's the feeding of the flesh and John says in uh, 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 through 17 it's the lust of the flesh lust of the eyes and the pride of life that's why sin is such a challenge for us and the Ninevites realize that they dealt with that. And so, how does God judge unrepentant sin? Romans, Romans 7 and 8, which I alluded to earlier, is a great passage on this. Because Paul basically says in Romans 7 that, you're, that in sin you're living according to the flesh. And then Romans 8 is in Christ, you're living according to the Spirit. Romans 8, 1. I don't know how many times I've heard my dad quote this passage. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now the beauty of it is we have 1 John 1, 7. Where if we're walking in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we're walking in the light, that's a big if. I have a, a, a problem with some of my theological friends who would say that once you're saved, you cannot lose that status. And I, I wonder, well, maybe there was a time where you were walking in, in the light and then something in life happened and we stopped walking in the light, and we started walking in darkness, and walking is a continual verb. That's how we live, is in darkness. There's no more light. The light's gone out. What then? You can't have the blood if you're not walking in the light. That's the, the condition. How does God judge unrepented sin? Sin will kill you. The wages of sin is death, Romans 3.23. All right, one more. Uh, in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 11, which is the last verse of, of the book, we see abundantly the grace of God. Incredibly abundant. Because God was going to destroy the city, but they repented. And in Nahum chapter 3, 
we read the justice of God. So this is chapter 3 and verse 19. Nahum says, Your destruction is like an incurable wound. Your demise is like a fatal injury. All who hear what's happened to you will clap their hands for joy. For no one ever escaped your endless cruelty. Uh, in, the, in the Assyrian world, there was a goddess of healing. We talked a couple of Sunday nights ago about the man at the pool of Beit Zatha and how he was wanting to get into the water when the water was stirred. Right? That goes back to a, a Greek god, Asclepius, uh, who's a god of healing, stirring the waters. Well, there was a, an Assyrian goddess of healing, but the goddess of healing could also be a goddess of cursing. And there are records of curses that would be prayed in the name of this goddess where she would inflict an incurable wound on you. And ultimately it would kill you, but it would be a very slow and painful death. And some people have said that that's the imagery that Nahum is using here in 319. Very harsh, full of justice. So what do we do with that? How do we compare the grace of God with the justice of God? There's one key word that puts everything in balance here, in my opinion. I don't know, you may disagree. Obedience. Right? The grace of God was extended to the people of Nineveh and Jonah. They obeyed the teaching of Jonah, whatever that may have been, and they repented. But they failed in keeping with obedience, and in that failing, the justice of God was poured out on them. That is exactly what's going to happen to every one of us on the judgment day. So are we being obedient and living in the grace, love, mercy, and salvation of the Lord? Or are we not? It's one or the other. And... Uh, Understand this, I'm not saying that works get us into heaven. They don't. But Ephesians 2.10 tells us to do good works because of what Christ has done for us. Not to get to heaven, but because Christ has already done the work. Any questions or comments? Well, I hope someone in here comes up with something for us to study next week or else I'm going to have to come up with something. And if anyone wants to, uh, to, to take a crack at teaching, it, you're more than welcome to. Uh, just let me know. We'll work something out. We'll close with prayer and uh, we have a lot to pray for, don't we? Let's bow. Father, we thank you so much for a great day. We thank you for the beautiful weather and the sunshine and the warmth that we feel we pray, Lord, that we will use every day as a blessing to bless others and that we will glorify in your Son, that we, like Paul, will boast only in your Son and in the cross and in the salvation that we get through him. Father, help us to be humble. Help us to be gentle and quiet people. But Father, help that gentle and quiet spirit make a presence in this world. Lord, our world is in shambles. It's always been since the fall, but Father, it seems like things just continually get worse every day. And, and I pray, Lord, that you will have a hand in this, that peace will come, that uh, your word can be spread throughout the world without the fear of harm. And Father, I pray that you will keep all of us safe and that you will keep our brothers and sisters in Christ safe in places outside of this nation. Lord, for those who are sick and who are bereaved, who are hurting, whatever their need is, Father, I pray that you will bless them and that you will use us as servants of yours to take care of them. Father, for the ones joining us online tonight who uh, could not be here but wanted to, I pray your blessings on them. We pray that they would be able to be with us again very soon. Lord, thank you for every day that you've given us, and we pray especially that you will forgive us because we do sin. 
we fall into those temptations. And Father, I pray that you will help us to, to do better, not because our works get us there, but because of what your work has done in Jesus. We love you, Lord. Keep us safe. Be with us. In your son's name we pray. Amen.